This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for being volunteers at Met How at Home. Thanks to everyone who is going to be watching this video later. And thanks so much to Colleen, who um, has chosen Met How at Home to work with for her doctoral capstone project from the University of Puget Sound. And I'll let you fill in your intro. Um, however much you, you want to, Colleen, but she chose to work with our volunteers since you are all are the backbone of Met Hall and Home. Center's Pharmacy. Yeah, so um, I connected with Met Hall at Home about two years ago through a research project with Jan Kittleson. And then when it came time to decide on my capstone project, I opted to stay with the organization. Um, and my research project was focused on falls prevention. And so I wanted to take that project and expand it a little bit more and get into some of the more like nitty gritty details of that. And through talking with Jan and Tracy and Selena, um, we really narrowed the scope to working with the volunteers because you all, as Tracy said, are the backbone of the organization. And you also are in a really unique position where you have your, the boots on the ground, you have your eyes on the individuals. And so you can really spot certain things that may go unseen otherwise. And so you can um, alert the staff members to certain needs that the community members may have that they may not otherwise know that the person needed. Um, so that was how we came to this training um and let's see i'm gonna go ahead and share my screen chrome oh no i was worried about this okay give me one minute oh all the little technical all my authentication yeah. stuff which just shuts off randomly Mm hmm. I know we often have serious Zoom technical difficulties. I don't know what it is with Zoom. Zoom and Chromebook do are not great friends. Don't play well together. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna minimize this. We saw it. Oh, yeah. where, why did it go away? Why don't we saw it? And then Tracy too, you'll be able to let me know if um, there are any questions or things like that because now I can't see. Yes. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. I think, oh my back. Oh. Yes, everybody. so everybody feel free to put questions into the chat and I'll, I'll watch for that. All right, so ready to begin? Um, so welcome to Helping the Helpers. Um, I just gave you my little intro. Um, and so first and foremost, I just want to say thank you again. As Tracy said, you are the backbone of the community. All the work you do is greatly appreciated um, by the organization, by the members of the community. And I wanted to say thank you from me for um, helping and supporting me on this educational endeavor, because without you, I would not be able to have completed it, so thank you. And I have a lot that I'd like to get through. Um, so based on the survey that you all filled out a couple of months ago, um, I decided to go pretty broad strokes with this training session and just providing um, some information on a lot of things to try to create a foundation for future programming for you all. Um, so, we may or may not get to all of it. We didn't get through everything yesterday, but yesterday was a little unique in that we were able to do some more hands-on training stuff. So hopefully we can get through more of it today. Um, but by the end of this session, I hope that you feel more confident in providing physical assistance to community members and various contexts and environments. I hope that you learn oh, a few gosh. techniques to support the mental and physical health of the community member. 
um, that you can recognize when to contact Metno at Home for a referral to the Lookout Coalition or to other community agencies and how to recognize signs of caregiver burnout and know some tools and available resources to turn to and to utilize. Um, I should have checked before we started. Did everyone have a couple, like a sheet of paper with them? Because I have a few writing prompts. Um, so if you do, um, the first one would be, why did you choose to volunteer with MetHow at Home? either instead of or in addition to some of the other organizations in the area, because I know there are several. And if you just wanna take a moment to reflect on that and then we'll get going again. And this is a little tricky for me because I can't see anyone to gauge, so. Yeah, it looks like folks are, are ready. Yeah. Also, just so everyone knows, I did, um, there's a little background noise, so I muted everyone. So if you want to um, speak, you'll just have to unmute yourself. Okay, good. Okay, so. Um, another activity that I planned for throughout the um, session is to, on four separate small pieces of paper, to write down um, one thing that is of value to you. So the idea of this activity is to consider the aging process and um, the idea of gain and loss across the lifespan. And so I want you to, um, pr preferably on separate slips of paper, write down one possession that you value. On the next slip of paper, something within your environment that you value. So for me, it's being able to see trees out of my bedroom window every day. Um, on the third one, one activity that you value participating in. And on the fourth one, um, a relationship that you value, and that can be with a person or an organization or even a place. And just take a moment to complete that. Are we looking about done there? Yeah, I can't see absolutely everyone, but okay. we look we look done. Okay. So I wanted to begin the session talking about falls and falls prevention. Um because that really is the, the cornerstone of this entire training. Everything I'm going to talk about after this is, relates to falls prevention in some way. So um, falls, um, just some st stats on falls. So more than one in four older adults falls each year and less than half of those report it. Um, falling one time doubles your chance of falling again. So it's absolutely critical that we prevent that initial fall from happening in the first place. One in five falls results in serious injury or death. Um, falls are the leading cause of traumatic brain injury and any injury to the brain is going to impact our cognition, our moods, our behaviors, pretty much everything. And it's worth noting that the majority of falls happen at home. And so this is, 
part of where you all come in and being those um, eyes and ears of the individual and just being able to recognize some signs of a fall risk in a person so that you can contact Metau at home and um, get them the help that they need. So some causes of falls are, you know, the typical environmental hazards, the things you can control, like household clutter, uh, the things you can't control, like um, ice on a sidewalk. Uh, your medications can have some side effects that cause dizziness or changes in blood pressure or um, cause you to be off balance. Substance abuse is a big one. Um, improper clothing, sometimes long pants or pajamas or bathrobes can get tangled up and uh, caught underneath your feet or tangled up in your ankles. And so you go to stand and take a step and you may fall. And same with improper footwear. So anything uh, like flip floppy or um, Crocs, if you don't have the little ankle or heel strap in place, that kind of thing, those can be a trip hazard. Impaired balance and weakness. Um, our stability really comes from our core muscles. And if we have a weak core, it's going to make everything else pretty unstable and your chances of falling increase dramatically. Um, vision changes naturally. If I can't see a hazard, I'm likely going to trip over it. And then thinking about vitamin deficiencies and how our nutrition goes back to that weakness component. And also if I am deficient in calcium or vitamin D and I fall, I'm likely to break a bone and then I will be hospitalized. And then my health outcomes are that much more negative. So all of these things are why it's absolutely critical that we address that, prevent that very first fall from happening. And some ways of preventing are the typical clearing the home of hazards, um, rearranging furniture so that you create pathways. You can also use furniture to support yourself as you move through an environment. Uh, rearranging storage, so not having heavy things up on a high shelf that you run the risk of pulling it down and it falling on you and you fall to the floor or having things that you commonly use too far down to the ground so that you aren't continually bending down and pulling it out of place. Some of the typical home modifications like installing grab bars or using non-slip mats um, in the bathroom or to secure rugs. Again, wearing appropriate footwear. Increasing the lighting so that you can see your environment and any hazards that may be in the way. Talking to a doctor about medical or medication side effects um, that you can anticipate so that you can maybe change your medication schedule as a result. Getting um, regular vision and screening, uh, vision and hearing screens, and then also just getting some of that physical exercise to increase that core strength and balance. And so again, you'll hear this um, kind of stated throughout the entire session. If you, if a community member tells you that they've fallen, if you see that they're unstable as they're walking, um, or if you see anything within the home environment that may contribute to a fall or risk, just go ahead and contact Metau at home and um, they can have that conversation and start uh, just initiate that process of getting some of those things taken care of before the very first fall happens, hopefully. So now we'll start getting into some of the nitty gritty. Um, so as we age, our senses change. It's just for the most part, all natural changes we don't have a lot of control over, but we can take steps to address them. Um, and so, and thinking about things like decreased vision, um, I may no longer be able to read medication labels. And so that would just lead to medication misuse, taking things at the wrong time, taking too much of something. Um, it can lead to my not being able to read expiration dates on food and eating spoiled foods and getting really sick. And again, just going back to that, that falls risk. If I can't see a hazard, I'm likely going to trip over it. Um, natural changes in hearing as our hearing decreases, uh, so does my ability to hear alarms, um, either smoke alarms or the alarm that the fridge door is open and I run the risk of my food spoiling. Um, I can't hear instructions from my medical providers, and I also just can't hear conversation. So I just stop participating in social activities because I just can't hear you. And our skin and um, 
musculature as we age changes too. So our skin becomes thinner. And as, um, as we age, the messaging system between our skin to our brain also starts to slow down. So as a result, our reaction time starts to slow down too. So I may not notice that a water, the water is way too hot until I'm, I am already burned. Um, I may not notice that I have a cut on my foot until it's already infected. And then going back to that balance piece that I was talking about with falls, um, everything contributes to our sense of balance, being able to see, being able to hear, being able to feel the environment around us, all of those things impact balance. So we just need to make sure everything else is taken care of so that we can maintain that one central piece. And this is a visual just to give you an idea of some of the how some conditions can impact our vision. So that top larger photo is um, what normal vision looks like. So everything's in focus. I can tell foreground from background. I've got clear depth perception. Going down to macular degeneration, you start to lose that the vision in the um, center of the eye around the pupil, but everything else stays relatively normal. Um, with cataracts, everything starts to blur and flatten and you lose a lot of that depth perception. And then with glaucoma, the peripheral vision shrinks. And so um, you're just left with that kind of tunnel vision, that central vision. And so a few things to look out for, for changes in vision. Um, if the community member reports of change of vision, that's a quick and easy one. Um, pretty obvious that you know that you need to contact MAH for that person to get a referral. If you notice decreased activity, um, especially in activities that involve a lot more visual detail work like crossword puzzles or sewing, um, that's a good indication. Increased fear while walking in new environments. So people tend to stick to certain areas if they know that the path is safe. Going out into a new environment, if I'm losing my depth perception, I may not know um, dips in the ground or where a curb may be that I may trip over. An increased need for brighter light or magnification. If you walk in and the person just got all of their lights blasting and they're still having a hard time seeing, that's a good indication that they need a vision screen. Um, when we squint, we're narrowing our focus to what we absolutely need to. And so that may be something that someone does is just start squinting to really just focus in on that one small piece. <clears throat> and then the decrease in grooming or hygiene kind of goes hand in hand with that last one, the inattention. Um, if I can't see this side of my body when I'm getting ready in the morning, I may not necessarily brush that side of my hair or um, address a stain on this side of my shirt. And then different conditions can impact vision in different ways. So sometimes I may be able to see from here over, um, but not like all the way for, over to my left side. Um, and then conversely, it could just be one side, it could be both sides, my loss of peripheral vision or my loss of my central vision. So if you notice any changes, say something to a staff member at Met How at Home so that they can reach out to the appropriate people. Okay, so now I would like you to throw away one of those um, slips of paper that you filled out earlier of the things that you value in life. and just reflect for a moment on what it's like to now be without that thing. And so next I'm, I'm going to start getting into talking about um, providing physical assistance to the community member. But um, first I feel like it's important to address how to do that while keeping your body safe. Um, patient handling is the number one injury for healthcare workers and back, shoulders, and wrists are the most commonly injured parts of the body. And so it's very, very important for you to address your own health before you help someone else. Um, so some do's and don'ts of safe lifting, and this applies to all of life, not just helping somebody get up off of the floor. So always ask for help. If the 
thing that you're trying to pick up, if you think it's too heavy or you know that it's too heavy, just go ahead and get someone else to help you. Um, the way you stand makes a big difference. So stand with your feet, shoulder, hip width apart, not with your feet side by side and keep a nice soft bend in your knees. Don't keep your knees locked out. Um, keeping that soft bend just allows your body um, to be better able to receive that the force and the weight that you're about to pick up. Um, bend through the knees while maintaining a straight back to pick something up. So don't just bend forward at the hip and lean down and pick something up. Bring an item close to your chest. You don't want to pick something up way out here in space and try to carry it. Just pull it towards you, pick it up, keep it close to your body at bo before you lift. And then tighten those core muscles because that's what's going to keep your back nice and stable through a lift. And then use the big muscles of your legs and your butt to do most of the lifting. Those are the, kind of the powerhouses of our muscles. And so just utilize them to protect your back. And then you should also keep your nose or uh, Toes, knees, hips, and eyes all facing in the same direction while turning. So that way you're not just jerking to one side with something heavy and running the risk of tweaking your back or straining a muscle. And these are just a couple of visuals to go over what I was just talking about. So let's go with Cam. Um, so maintain, so bending through um, the knees and the hips and maintaining that straight back to reach down um, and then coming up using lifting with the legs rather than the back. So coming over to this person, you can see she's just bending straight over. Um, and that's that's lifting with the back and that's how you're going to injure yourself. And just twisting and rotating unnecessarily, twisting and rotating unnecessarily. So these are the absolutely do not do body positions and body mechanics. And as far as um, ergonomics for caregivers specifically goes um, in order to keep yourself safe, go ahead and follow the safe guidelines that I just, uh, safe lifting guidelines that I just went over. Have the person help you as much as they can. There's no reason for you to try to lift somebody up out of a chair if they can push themselves most of the way out of it and you can just act as an assist. If you need to use furniture and things like that in your environment, um, just make sure that it's secure, that you're not going to put pressure down on a chair and have it flop over on you. You can use other materials like pillowcases or um, plastic bags underneath the person to help you while you're trying to rotate them, um, pulling them towards you or repositioning them. This is especially helpful for um, things like helping people get in and out of cars. Um, always check the floor for slip or trip hazards. Pretty obviously, if you get someone up and moving, you don't want there to be something in the middle of the floor that you didn't see before that is now a trip hazard. Um, use the person's waistband or clothing to assist you. So you can hold on to someone's um, waistband of their pants uh, to support them. Um, you'll see that in one of the videos I'm going to show later of how to do that while helping somebody get up off of the floor. You can also use loose clothing to um, reposition somebody in a chair too. And pretty much most importantly, if you realize that you're unable to complete a transfer or a move, just ease the person back down onto the original surface. Don't try to chuck them into their wheelchair over to the side. Don't just try to muscle through it and risk injuring yourself. Just lower them back down, reposition yourself and start over again. And if you are injured <clears throat> while trying to help a community member, always contact MAH immediately and get that on, um, notify them of that. Use whatever you need to, to make yourself feel better, um, including ice and anti-inflammatory medication, and then see your, med your um, medical provider for any sustaining injuries. And I just wanted to go over some um, tips and etiquette while providing assistance. So number one, don't assume that someone wants help or even that they need help. Always ask before you help someone and absolutely always ask before you touch someone. Um, and that extends to their equipment. So just if somebody uses a walker or a cane or a wheelchair for mobility, just think of that piece of equipment as an extension of themselves and ask permission before you touch it or before you even move it. 
So if you think about being a person that relies on a walker for and your ability to get up and move, if somebody just picked it up and moved it 10 feet away from you, you're just being stripped of your ability to move up on your own volition. So just think of their equipment as an extension of them and ask permission before you touch it. Always respect someone's independence and ability. So even if um, someone moves very, very slowly and it is not the most efficient thing in the world, just go ahead and let them do the walking on their own. Um, we want people to retain all of the abilities and skills that they have for as long as they possibly can. So until it gets to a point where it's unsafe and they're not able to walk on their own steadily, then just go ahead and let them walk. Um, use simple language, be direct and make um, polite commands rather than asking. So this is um, something I think about more in terms of people that are um, experiencing cognitive decline. Um, just keep your language really simple and direct. Um, just make clear instructions for what you want them to do. And don't ask a lot of questions like, can you get up and move? Can you move over there? Just say, we're gonna move over there now. And just keep it simple. Um, cue and pace with the person's movements. So if you tell a person, we're going to go get in the car, but first I need to stand you up, then we're going to walk over this way, and then we're going to go out this door, and then we're going to go over there. Like, okay, are you ready? They're not going to be ready. They're going to remember that you said that they were going to the car, and that was about it. And similarly, if you wait until they're halfway through something before you tell them what they're going to do next. That's also going to make them really frustrated. So just cue and pace with the person's movement so that they can anticipate things in a normal um, amount of time. And just know that you may need to make more than one attempt. Um, and that's fine. That's fine for everybody. If the person's uncomfortable, if you're uncomfortable, set them back down, reassess, start again. And then before you get someone up and moving, always make sure they're wearing appropriate footwear again, and make sure that they're not tangled up in any of their clothing so that you don't get them up and then they trip. Always be aware of a person's limiting factors. So if they have a broken wrist or they're still in treatment for a broken wrist and they have weakness on that side, don't expect them to be able to push themselves up with that wrist. You may need to add more, provide more assistance on that side. Certain precautions after surgery, especially things like hip replacement and knee replacement, anything in the um, uh, heart area, lots of precautions come with that. So just be aware of it. And then also know that fear is a limiting factor. So if somebody's fallen in the past or been dropped in the past and they don't know you, that fear is going to impact their ability to receive help from you. Um, you always want to stand on or support the weaker side. So if I'm standing next to someone who is weak on the right side, I'm going to stand on that side in case that right knee buckles. I'll be right there to catch them with my body. I won't need to try to pull them back to standing from this side or suddenly get really quickly behind them. They can just fall to me and I support them and then we take care of them. When you're helping someone move, never ever let them wrap their arms around your neck. Um, if you fall or they fall, you can both be injured. And similarly, never pull on someone's arms or shoulders. Our shoulder is actually a really pretty delicate um, joint overall, and it can be damaged and injured pretty easily, especially in older adults when some of that musculature starts to thin a little bit and get a little bit weaker. Um, we also have a what I call the nerve superhighway that runs down um, through our neck, the spine in our neck and down into our arm. And so you can do a lot of nerve damage by pulling too hard or compressing on that um, shoulder area. And if someone uses a walker, make sure all four feet are on the ground before they get up and get moving. Same thing with the tip of their cane, make sure it's flat on the floor and always make sure that wheelchair brakes are locked. 
and have a plan before you begin moving. So you don't want to get someone standing and then realize that their walkers in the other room or that their wheelchair is actually in the trunk of the car. You want to have everything in place before you get going. And you want them to be an active participant in moving too. So just cue them. We're going to move on three and have that person count one, two, three. And that keeps everyone on the same page and aware of what's happening. And so <clears throat> there is a no lift policy for you all. So there's not an expectation for you to ever physically pick someone up entirely, but you can provide help to someone that's fallen if it's safe to. So if someone falls and you, you should always ask about pain, um, about dizziness, about nausea, um, ask if they hit their head. There will be some circumstances where shock may take over and they may not know that they were injured um, or there may be some, some issues where the person is not really the best judge of their own character. And so in those circumstances, don't try to move them, just leave them where they are, call 911, call Matt Howe at home and just stay with them until somebody comes to help them. But best case scenario, somebody falls, they're uninjured, um, you've checked to make sure they aren't dizzy, they aren't in pain, they didn't hit their head, then you can um, walk them through and getting up off of the floor using a chair and you can do like really, really minimal assistance in order to help them. So we are going to watch one video of how to do that. <clears throat> And you'll see some of that um, using of clothing to support and help the person too. Um, and they, in this situation, they've already um, assessed that the person is uninjured and they've set up two chairs, one at the head and one at the feet of the person as well. And that's on the floor. Um, all right. So the first thing we're going to do is after I've assessed that she's fine and she's okay, and we're going to begin the process of getting her up. I'm going to ask her to take her upper hand or upper arm and put her hand flat on the ground because she's going to push herself up off of that. And of course, you want to be instructing them um, if you can, uh, if they can follow the instructions on as you go along. Um, then you want to take the upper leg and move the knee up a little bit further because they're going to end up getting on all fours. So that's the position that's going to best help them. And right from my perspective as a the person on the floor, you might want to ask them to move their other leg back a little bit just to give them some maneuvering room. Okay, so the, whatever will work to get them on all fours. All right, Robin, so I'm going to ask you to um, push yourself up with your hand, and I'm going to place my hand underneath her shoulder and help lift her up that way to get to all fours. All right, can you push up? And then I have my other hand on her clothing, helping her hip to go um, up. So now that she's on all fours, I can bring the chair closer to her head, closer to her. Okay, Robin, can you put your hand up on the chair and um, both hands up? And so now she's on, can you bring your knees further, walk towards the, um, the chair? There we go. So now she's up. At this point, you may want to um, wait a minute or two because sometimes when they get up, off, when anyone gets up off the floor, um, they may uh, be dizzy, especially if they have low blood pressure. Um, or I don't know, does it happen with high blood pressure? But uh, definitely low blood pressure. So wait a minute or two, wait till they feel okay. In the meantime, you're going to bring the uh, chair by uh, that was by her feet close to her because you're going to end up sitting her seating her on that chair. And again, from a person's perspective on the floor, I happen to be on the carpet right now when we throw rugs, but right. if I was on the hardwood floor, you can always take a, a towel that's folded and put it underneath the person's knees to make it a little more comfortable for them. Right, exactly. Thank you, forgot about that. <laughs> so, um, all right. So now I've got her on, on knees and she's leaning her weight on her arms. So I'm going to uh, ask her to bring your strong leg up in front of you so that the foot is flat on the ground. And then I'm going to help her as she pushes herself up for the purpose of sitting in the back chair. 
And you want to have this back chair as close to the person as you can, because when they get up, they may be dizzy or whatever, and they could fall backwards. So you don't want to have any gap in between their behind and the chair. <laughs> right. All right. So can you push yourself up with that leg? And I'm going to guide you back here. And that's it. Do not let go of the person um, until they're completely seated and uh, comfortable and you know that they're safe. And um, I wouldn't walk away from them for a few minutes just in case um, they are dizzy and they could topple over. And then you'd have to go through it all over again. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and we had a few really great questions come up after that yesterday. Um, so one person that, one volunteer that was um, there yesterday, he pointed out that you, um, so I demonstrated how to do this with um, a person on the floor and her remarks were that it was, um, you have to be really trusting when you're going back into the chair because you can't see it. And so we had a volunteer who was there who suggested um, really kind of uh, not necessarily knocking the person on the behind with the chair, but just so that they can have that physical input that they know that the chair is there. And so that way they feel much safer going back into it. And the person I was helping off of the floor pointed out that um, the chairs we were using to demonstrate didn't have a cushion on them, but it may be a good idea to just go ahead and have a towel or something in place there in case the person's arms buckle and they lean forward or fall forward and they could hit their forehead on the chair. And so just having something to soften that blow would be really helpful. And another person asked a question about um, what if the person falls and it's their weak side, that is the side that is up. Um, so it's preferred to not, um, so say my strong side is my right side, but the way I fall and land, my left side is what's up in the air. It's preferred for you to not have the person just try to push themselves up with that right arm underneath them because if they, it's hard, first of all, it's hard to get your arm under there and get that leverage, um, but they're that much more likely to have that elbow buckle and fall back down and then you risk them hitting their head. So having them roll over onto their side is pretty easy. You can just help guide them. So you would just put, um, so if you're laying on your right side, you would just put your hand under their right knee and guide, um, lift their knees and guide their left shoulder down to the ground at the same time so that they would end up with their knees up in the air. And then hand under the right shoulder and on the right knee and push them over. So that way then they're now laying on their left side and they can go ahead and push off with their right hand. Um, I know that's hard to visualize, but um, that would really be the, the preferred way to get them back up off the floor. And then there's another video, we're not going to watch it, but it's a really great reference um, for you all to check out later. So she does, um, a, it's a really long video too. She does several different ways to utilize things in your environment to help you get back up um, and gives a lot of really great tips on um, if the person's not able to get their legs underneath them necessarily, how they can scoot back up and to back up to a couch and then push themselves up to a couch to get to seated that way. So that would be one, a good one to check out later for sure too. And then I wanted to go over um, getting in and out of the car too. So this seems to be one that um, I know this is talked about initially in your volunteer training. Um, I wanted to give a, a more of a video and step-by-step -step guide for how to do this too, because I don't know that it's necessarily as intuitive and there are a lot of tricks and tips that you can use to help people. Um, and so I did create a step-by-step -step guide for it and how to what steps you go through and how to cue people. And then I also just provided a video to watch. And this video is from Tipa Snow, who if any of you have done um, 
work with people with dementia. She's a great, great resource and just has tons of videos to watch and every possible thing to do with people with dementia. And so this video is aimed at how to help people who do have dementia. So they will, it, they will require a little bit more um, assistance than what you may run into with volunteer with the community members that you're helping. So what we're going to do is actually demonstrate this with Catherine, a friend of ours who's willing to participate. So let's say I have Catherine. I can bring her up either in a wheelchair or with her walker. I'm going to go move into that position. So Catherine is here. I'm going to have her hold on here and I'll move the walker or the wheelchair and I'll have her come to stand. Then what I'm going to do is have her turn and it's going to be shift, shift, shift. Shift, shift, shift. As little steps as needed. I mean, if she can do big steps, that's great. If not, we're going to be taking smaller steps. Now, what I can do is say, Catherine, put your head down here and through here. There you go. There you go. That's it. Good. Lean forward a little bit more. There you go. Good. Nice job. Perfect. And then I open the door back up and say, hey, Catherine. Put your hand right here. Nice. Now, instead of doing your feet, what I do is lay my forearm right above your knee, take my arm and lift like that. And then like this. And then he's in. So the other way we can do that, if Catherine is having a hard time here sitting down, She's not getting what I'm doing and she's getting worried. If I kneel down and then I take her hips back, I can keep her head down low so that she's able to get there. And then once again, I have her position here and here and here and here. Notice what I'm doing is using my forearm, not my hand or my wrist, and I'm using leverage so that I'm in a stronger part of my body and my back is straight and my knee is down or I'm seated on something. I don't want to do it like this because what's going to happen is I have a risk of hurting myself. So hopefully that's helpful. If not, let us know where you're still struggling and we'll see what we can do to help you out. So what we're gonna demonstrate now is sometimes people don't have trouble getting in the car, it's actually getting out of the car because especially tall people or people who have challenges at coming to stand because of weakness in the legs, um, problems with organizing themselves to turn and lean and get somewhere. What we're going to do is Lauren's volunteer to help us out here. And what we're going to do is show how a step by step you might be able to help with this. So, Lauren, what I'm going to have you do is take this foot and we're going to actually lift it and bring it out. Okay. And then we're going to lift this one and bring this one out. Then I'm going to have you hold on with this hand and this hand for a little bit. Now, reach out here. There you go. Keep your head forward and come forward and stand up. There you go. How was that? Easier. Easier. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sturdier. Sturdier. Steadier. Steadier and sturdier. Both. Great. Thanks. Sometimes the problem isn't getting in the car, it's actually getting out. That can be the case for really tall people or people who have leg weakness or trunk weakness as they move forward in the disease. So what we're going to do is help Lauren get out. And to do that, rather than trying to have her pivot and put her legs out, I'm going to do the assist on that part because the pivoting of your body while you're seated can be a challenge. I'm going to come down and much as we did going in, I'm going to have Lauren, let's pick your leg up and bring this one out. And then we're going to hold hands. And the reason we hold hands is I don't want her losing her balance backwards. I want her to stay forward and to take her weight to this hip rather than that hip. I'm gonna do the same thing here, and bring it over. I'm gonna actually bring it around a little bit further and then have Lauren reach for the open window. So 
hard reach forward all the way over here. And on three, there you go. If someone is pulling really hard, what you can do is have someone else hold the door or hold it yourself so you know they're stable. How was that? Easier. Safer. Safer, too. Or, or not falling. More probability that you're not going to come out the side with poor control. And so she did. A lot of things I really liked, and she did one particular thing I really did not like. Um, so she used a she had a pillowcase on the car seat. You may have noticed that that makes it easier for the person to turn. Um, so that was already in place before they got going. She had really great body mechanics through it, and she commented on that how she squatted down, she knelt down rather than bending forward. But the thing she did that I did not like was um, she reached under the person's arm to lift them up out of the car. And there may have been a number of reasons why she did that, but um, don't do that. Just don't, don't do anything that may cause too much strain on that shoulder and in that armpit area. Um, what you can do is kneel down, get your hand around their, your arm around their waist. You can use their waistband to help lift them up. Um, you can also if you communicate what you are doing, feel free to just put your hands underneath someone's bottom um, to just give them that extra boost where they need it. But always communicate that your hands are going um, underneath them and where they may be and why before you just jump in there and do it. And so I just did this yesterday too. So next I wanted to move on to assistive devices um, and assistive devices and adaptive equipment um, just allow a person to adapt the activities they already perform after um, an, for a number of reasons. So they may be experiencing decreased mobility or function. Um, they may have just, they may be healing from surgery. They may be experiencing changes in vision or hearing. Uh, they may have a degenerative disease or cognitive changes. And so using assistive devices and adaptive equipment just allows them to continue to perform those activities that they were performing before. It just helps maintain their independence for longer. Um, the use of devices may be temporary or permanent too, depending upon the person's condition. So as we go through these, the idea is just, is not that you would ever be the one to provide a piece of equipment or suggest to someone that they needed something. The idea is just that if you recognize that someone's having a hard time with a certain thing, um, say that they say they're experiencing a lot of fatigue when they're bathing. And so they're just bathing less often now, just go ahead and contact MAH and let them know, hey, this person could probably use a tub bench or a handheld shower or something like that, that would just allow them to continue bathing on a regular schedule and maintaining that personal hygiene. Um, but that isn't a conversation you need to have with the community member. And it's not something that you need to take it upon yourself to address directly. Just always go back and contact MAH for all of those things. So I've made um, documents for everyone and you'll have access to all of these things. Um, after the fact, all of this information will be shared with you. And the documents that I've made um, provide you with some information on both what the equipment is, um, different things that you may run into or see, um, how they should fit. So if you recognize that someone has a cane that's way too tall for them or way too short for them, it's just a way for you to um, recognize that a change needs to happen, that something needs to be addressed, and then you just contact MAH so that that person's needs would be taken care of. You do not need to be the one to adjust the height of a cane or a walker or crutches or anything like that. Um, I also just gave some information and instructions on how to go do things like a sit to stand, so going from seated to standing while using a cane or a walker. 
the main thing to always know is that the cane goes on the stronger side of the person. So it acts as a counter to the weaker side. Um, and this just provides visuals and also um, verbal step-by-steps on how to cue someone to go from um, seated to standing. And then the same thing with walking. So the appropriate way to use a, a cane. So if you notice that somebody is not using their walker or cane properly, then you can just go ahead and contact a staff member and they can have someone from the Lookout Coalition maybe go in and do some retraining for how to better use that piece of equipment. Um, I also gave you information on how to cue people to go up and down stairs. I did this with um, canes, walkers, and wheelchairs, and crutches, I believe. And so the rule of thumb with pretty much all of that equipment um, and going up and down stairs or over curbs is up with the good and down with the bad. So the cane is placed on the stronger side. When going up a stair or up a curb, um, you step up with the strong leg first, and then you bring the, the cane and the weak leg up after. When going downstairs, you step down with the weak leg and the cane, and then you step down with the strong leg. So up with the good and down with the bad. And I've made these for walkers as well. So there are different types of walkers. You can get an idea of what um, appropriate posture may or not may or may not be. So if someone has to lean way too far forward in order to use their walker, it's not an appropriate fit for them. Um, information on sit to stand, um, different things to look for. So if someone goes to stand up and all four feet of the walker are not on the ground, that's a no no. Um, before sitting down on the walker, like things are not in place and you're not lined up properly and you leave that big gap between um, your the back of your legs and your seat, you have the risk of falling. So that's not a great idea either. And neither is it a good idea to just start turning and walking before both hands are secured on the walker. And then some more tips on what to not do while walking with a walker. And then tips on how to talk someone through go, going up over a curb or up a step, back down, and then up multiple steps. And I provided information on wheelchairs too. Um, so wheelchairs can get a bit complicated. They're, they're the kind of thing where they're all a little bit different, but they're kind of the same. Um, so it may just, if you're familiar with one, the next one that you may need to work with may look completely different. So it's just a matter of finding all the little quirks of the individual wheelchairs. Unfortunately, they aren't standardized, fortunately and unfortunately, because they can just be fully customized to the individual, which is great. But having to continually relearn a piece of equipment each time you help someone is not really beneficial for the caregiver. Um, but to open a wheelchair, or I guess first to collapse a wheelchair, you put your hands on either the, the front and the back of the seat after you've removed any sort of cushion and you just pull straight up. In order to open up a wheelchair, you kind of wiggle the two sides apart and then you push down on the two bars on the right and left side um, of the seat that run along the, the armrests. And foot pedals can always be flipped up, turned out of the way, um they it's all it's all collapsible it's all very easy to use once you know what you're doing and wheelchairs have um the way the brake mechanisms work, work the person either pushes or pulls to lock or unlock the brakes there are um things called brake extensions which are really helpful and if you recognize that a person is having trouble with their locks that this may be something that would be good for them um, so they're just extensions of the brakes already. They just hook over the ends of the brake levers and they allow you to use less force and less leverage in order to lock and unlock your brakes. And they're fully removable too. They're not a permanent part of the wheelchair once you install them. And I wanted to give you all an idea of the different types of chairs because there are a lot. Um, they serve a number of different purposes. Each person that you meet is going to have a different wheelchair. Um, 
they just serve different purposes. And then I also wanted to give you an idea of um, going up and down curbs or over stairs while helping some or while helping someone that's in a wheelchair. So usually you want to get the go forward and get the casters up over the curb and then um, get close and use some force to get the big wheels up and over. You can do that backwards and that does require more lifting and pulling on your part too. But if um, there are benefits to this, if the person feels more secure going back rather than seeing where they're going, go for it. If they like to see where they're going, definitely go the forward way. If you are going up multiple steps, go ahead and have people help you because it's just a lot of lifting up and over and over and over and over. And then with going down, generally you want to go backwards. So you are the one moving backwards, stepping backwards. The big wheels come first and you're just easing them down, down the side of the curb. And then the casters come up and over. And you can do that going forward. But as you can see from this picture, that does require a lot of thrust on the part of the person in the wheelchair because they are just trusting that you have control over their wheelchair. We have at times, you know, um, had to transport someone from their home who didn't have a ramp and a wheelchair. And we actually asked Aeromet how to, to come and help with that because, okay. yeah, sometimes that just feels outside of our scope, I would yeah. say. Absolutely. Also, we have a really great comment in our um chat box and if this is an okay is it an okay time to um kind of open for a few questions for yeah. and address this because i think this is really key i was thinking about this as well um so this is what it says in the chat colleen i'm concerned that engaging mah would erode trust between myself and a member our members proactively approach to provide feedback and about bathing regularly, regularity and ease, alcohol use, footwear, slippers, trip hazards, etc. So, I think that's yeah, that's a fantastic um, question right there. Number one, when we do go to to speak with someone, we wouldn't say like, so we heard da, 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 you know, that sort of thing. We do a check-in call and we do check-in calls regularly to, to some of our more vulnerable folks, you know, um, of course, yeah, we would love to be able to be doing more of those check-in calls, but, and so I think that's a fabulous idea is to sort of have a standard set of questions that we check in regularly about. And, um, and that's something that I'm going to bring back to the staff actually of how to do that in a way that is respecting people's privacy, their dignity, their independence, while also setting up a culture that recognizes there are things that we can do, you know, to, um, to make our lives a little bit smoother. And at the end of the day, everybody has sovereignty <laughs> over their own choices, you know? And so we aren't here to be, yeah. Yeah. Forcing or policing or something like that, but just um, educating yeah, no folks yeah. you know yeah you can always make suggestions that doesn't mean anyone's going to follow through with them um and also members of the lookout coalition because they are um largely retired um people that were working in healthcare and were working as medical providers they do recognize how to use a certain level of tact and engaging with like starting that conversation and having those conversations with people so I, that is a great point to make, um, but I, yeah, I don't think that it would ever come back to where it would come back to you, where it would be your fault for any of these things being brought up. 
Yeah. And sometimes, you know, when we do those check-in calls and we might say, you know, just how are things going and get a general like pulse on the temperature. And if it seems at all like someone might be a good fit to bring the Lookout Coalition in and we can explain what it is, but yeah, they might not choose it. And that's, that's how it is. Yeah, this is Yaro, if I can for a second. I um, I could imagine that just a, a, like if a member, I'm sorry, if a volunteer could sort of trigger a, a poll like that, that looked a little bit more generic, but may include some touch points that, you know, the volunteer is interested in, in covering, like, the, some of the things that I listed in my chat, um, just because like the information that's being provided here is so excellent. And I actually think sharing a curated portion of that with a member based on kind of contributions from volunteers that says, you know, these are some things that um, maybe just even an education piece with the member would help kind of pave a path for some corrective um, effort. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for me, like I would hate for me to be welcomed into a home and then yeah. feel like, you know, because there, there is probably some, from some fear there and maybe at times some shame or yeah. uh, grief, uh, personal grief about their loss. And so, you know, I, I really want to be sensitive to that and ensure that I retain just an excellent relationship with them so that I am able to provide the best care that I can. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, Yaro, let's, let's talk a little further about some of those thoughts. And I think that's fantastic. Any other questions or comments before I keep going with equipment? Are you okay? Okay. I'm sorry, uh, Colleen. I, I actually have a question about the yeah. equipment. Yeah. Um, you talked about waistband and being able to, like, you know, if you can't really get at the waistband, then maybe you would um, be able to, like, get an arm under a bottom or something. But you know, I can just imagine that. I, I'm not sure that I would be, you know, I was kind of putting myself in the position of trying to get, helping someone get out of their chair. Yeah. And just being able to physically get your arm under there. I'm still yeah. kind of at a loss putting myself in that spot fully. And yeah, um, this is something where it is definitely tricky to try to talk people through it and seeing a physical demonstration is a lot easier. I just don't have another person to run through that with me here. Um, so usually um, you just have the person, if you're trying to get your hand underneath them, you would have them lean forward so that um, you could get kind of under their pelvic bone where you can feel, it's like your sits bones, um, where you can feel that, where you can just get, you're not digging into like musculature. You've got the support of the bone under your hand and that's where you're lifting from. Um, Usually talking about using loose, like using their clothing, if you can't get to their waistband or if they're wearing like elastic waistbands, because that's not going to be helpful to move anybody by certainly. Um, that's helpful with positioning, with moving them um, side to side or even pulling them backwards a little bit. Um, but that's more to do, that's pretty specified. So if someone is um, just sitting with really poor posture and can't kind of move themselves, that's when you would scooch them by using their, uh, like the loose clothing of their pants. Um, yeah, they, that's where like in and out of the car, if you, you know, put a, a oh, towel on the seat or, yeah. or even a pillowcase and then you, then you move the towel back yeah is um but you know honestly we try really 
hard if we do have somebody who's either temporarily in a wheelchair or you know their mobility is like this then we would met met how at home would strive to like have one of our people that's more trained to be the volunteer for that person but yeah. you know these are good tips though cuz i i've found myself in this position before <laughs> and and being like uh am i doing this right so <laughs> cuz you just never know when yourself or someone else is going to you know be having mobility issues yeah as a volunteer i mean i would certainly welcome be invite to be invited to a more complex situation as kind of a co-pilot with someone so that i could gain that experience without being you know the one um <laughs> so i don't i don't know yeah. if that sort of opportunity exists but i yeah. i would love to have that opportunity before before i was by myself that's a great idea. Yeah, that is definitely a more specialized situation, a higher need situation than what you will typically run into. Um, but it is just, yeah, being able to have some tips on how to utilize things in your environment in order to help people if you need to. is largely what I was trying to drive at with some of that. Um, okay. So just jumping into some options for equipment. Um, again, this is the type of thing where if you just recognize a need for it, it doesn't mean that you need to be the one to provide it um, or have that conversation. You can just bring it back to MAH and they can initiate that conversation and whatever changes happen, happen. Um, and if they don't, they don't. And that's fine too. Um, but so I just wanted to give an idea of different uh, um, options for things. So there are things like bedside commodes. That's um, a commode that's by the bed. So if the person has such limited mobility that they can't regularly make it all the way to the restroom, they've got a commode that's in a little bit closer to them so that they don't have to move quite as much. Um, raised toilet seats are great because they um, lower that gap that you have to sit down. So if you have l reduced strength in your legs, it can be a lot harder to stand back up from the toilet. Having a raised toilet seat means that you don't have to work as hard to stand back up. And these do get pretty specialized as well. So you can get some that have a tapered side on um, the right or the left in case the person has had something like a hip replacement surgery and they need to keep that one leg straight, they can't bend at the hip as well. So raised toilet seats do get to be pretty um, specific, which is great. And there are different size or styles. So some have handles that just hook right onto the toilet. Some um, have handles that sit over the top of the toilet. There are different types of shower benches and um, shower chairs. So the ones, um, these two, Part of the bench sits out on the outside of the bathtub so the person can either transfer from their wheelchair or just sit down directly onto that outside part and then turn and then they would get their legs inside and scooch all the way in. Um, and as you can see, there's that um, gap between the outside and then the part that's sitting inside the chair so that the shower curtain can run through so you don't end up with water all over the place. Shower benches and shower chairs are a little, um, you can think of those more for like energy conservation. So if the person can get themselves into the shower um, on their own, but they just kind of lose energy while they're in the shower, this just gives them the opportunity to take a nice long full shower um, while conserving some energy. And these are also great for um, shower stalls too. So if you don't have quite the width or the size of a standard like tub shower, these are good too. There are things like long handled sponges. These have really flexible thin plastic handles. So um, you can make them any shape that works for the person. They are pretty customizable. Things like handheld showers are considered adaptive equipment because you can use them while sitting down. There are a number of types of grab bars that can be installed um, around the house and then also specifically in 
the bathroom. And so that U-shaped one, um, as you can see, goes up and goes down so that um, it has a different um, applications and it's more appropriate for some people versus others, but it's definitely an option. There are things to help with bed mobility, like bed ladders. Um, these are just cloth ladders that lay alongside the person in the bed. They allow a person to pull themselves up to seated, and then they can also use them to rotate their bodies around to get their feet onto the ground. And bed rails work similarly. They help um, with sitting down into the bed and then with that rotation to get your legs up onto the bed too. And then there's just a bunch of different things that you can use around the house. So reachers are great multi-purpose tools. Um, they allow you within, within reason, there are weight limitations to them, but to reach things from up high or from down below. Um, if you're sitting down and you realize that your phone is you know, four feet away, then you can just use that rather than having to stand up and go get it and come back. There are a ton of dressing um, assistive devices now. So that sock aid or the sock goes um, over this long plastic funnel and your foot goes into it and then you just pull up on those ropes and then your sock comes on up over your toes and heels. Um, same thing with that compression hose aid. You get your toe in and then you pull it up. And if anyone's ever had to deal with compression hose, they're a beast. So having a tool to help work with those is just incredibly beneficial and will just allow someone to be more independent in their um, dressing. Foot funnels are great. They keep the foot, the shoe um, nice and open so that you can slide your foot in without that heel falling down and then having to take the whole thing off and start back over. And then again, there are ropes or strings that come up so that you don't have to bend down to take it off. You can just pull it right off. Um, a number of slings or orthoses. There's just tons of equipment for the kitchen. Um, so high-sided plates and bowls, these are great for people who have limited um, range of motion in their wrist. So if you have ever broken your wrist, you know that it's very hard to um, do that turning motion where you're like turning a key in a lock. So that becomes very, very challenging. So high-sided bowls just allow you to put a spoon into or fork into whatever you're eating, scooch over to that side, high side, and then um, you're able to have your spoonful of food and feed yourself. Universal cuffs are great. Um, they just cuff over the palm of your hand, just like that. They have a little pocket. You can put pretty much anything in them. So you can put a pen in there and use it to write. You can have uh, utensils in there so you can feed yourself, combs, toothbrushes, any number of things. And these are great just for people that don't have um, the ability to make a um, fist or like really have a strong grasp on something in their hand. And then you can always build up um, cutlery with a foamy material. So that same thing, it, th these are great for um, specifically people with like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so that way they don't need to have a really strong like closed fist around an object in order to use it. And just tons of things to use around the kitchen in general, um, choppers, pourers, um, adaptive cutting boards, things you can use in the, in the car um, so that you don't need to reach all the way over in order to get your seatbelt. There's a little seatbelt reacher. So you just need to go about to your shoulder and pull your seatbelt across. Even things like um, pill organizers that have bright, bright colors and large print. Um, those are great for people with low visibility. They're also great cognitive tools. So if people can really see a difference and um, from one day to the next, it will help them kind of orient themselves to what pills they need to be taking or allows you to just say, you know, today you take the orange compartment. And magnifiers, these are great. They're, you know, giant handheld magnifying glasses that you can use to look at your pill labels and things like that. They're also tabletop magnifiers that are a little bit more natural to read with. So somebody can continue to read on their own um, with low vision. And something I think is really important um, 
as the technology continues to grow and change, there are a lot of home safety devices like motion sensor lights. You can get ones that plug into the wall. You can get ones that just have an adhesive back that just run on batteries. And these would just turn on and illuminate the floor and the hall as you're getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night so that you don't trip over the cat on the way or trip over something else that's been left on the floor. And they use minimal power. They turn off after a certain period of time. Smart home devices are great. Just being able to yell at something and have it turn on all the lights in your house for you um, or specifically hallway lights and really, really improve safety. Um, it's another one, it's multiple uses. You can, you know, obviously have it turn on the radio for you, have it read books to you, um, listen to podcasts. You can make phone calls from it. If something happens, if you fall and you need to call 911, you can just yell at it to call 911 for you. And smartphones and smartwatches work similarly too. And then just getting into some um, cognition and low vision tools. So things like Alzheimer's clocks, these are nice, bright, um, large print clocks that are digital, but they're easy to read. And they just tell the person all of the information that they may need about the day to keep themselves oriented. And then whiteboards work the same way. And again, you'll have um, access to all of those documents too. And I just, one more quick note on home modifications. I did just want to say there's that safety doesn't have to be ugly. There's a lot of pushback on making home modifications because it can be costly, which is valid. And also that most of the equipment is ugly, which also is valid, but there are options for you. So all of the same protective measures are in place in both of these bathrooms. And one is clearly just like a nice home bathroom that's very um, individualized to the person. And the other one is clearly a medical facility, but they're equally as safe for the individual. So home mods don't have to be ugly was the main point I wanted to drive home there. And I also wanted to point out um, if you're unaware, there is a local durable medical equipment closet in TWISP. So it's run by a woman named Danny and um, it's free for everyone to use. You can borrow equipment for any length of time. You can donate equipment too. So if you've got a pair of crutches laying around from an old ankle injury, you can just send them her way. Someone will use them. Um, so all of the equipment that she has continually rotates out, but it's just a wonderful, wonderful resource to have in your community. And um, you should just be aware that it's there if you need it or if you know that somebody else may be able to take advantage of it, even just besides the community member that you're working with. And we're going to throw away another one of your slips. And then you just get to reflect for a moment on what it's like without that thing. Okay, and I am running short on time and I don't want to keep anybody longer than I said I would. So um, we're going to just kind of rush through a couple of the highlights for the remainder of the slides, just so that you see um, what's available to you. I wanted to, I knew that I was going to have more information than I, than I would likely get through, but I just wanted to have slides to represent all of the information, all of the handouts that I created. Um, so this is an interest list checklist or an interest checklist. Um, and these are fully customizable. So the idea behind this as a tool is to help you reflect on what you really enjoy doing and why. So is it that it's just a fun mental activity? Is it a really fun physical activity? Do you like the social aspect of it? Um, and it's the kind of thing where it can help you figure out new interests to explore on your own. And then conversationally, you can also use it with the community member that you're working with um, to gauge where your interests may overlap or if they are kind of tired of something that they've been doing or they're just losing interest in something that they've been doing. You can um, use this to help kind of suss out new things that they may want to try.
So no expectation to use this thing on your own, but just know that the, the idea is there. It's just to be a conversational tool. Um, so you all are in a really unique situation where you have pretty continual social interaction with community members and social interaction is incredibly important. Um, it directly impacts our mental and physical health both. There is a um, stat that um, prolonged social isolation is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So social isolation is very, very serious um, and can be very detrimental. And so you're just in a unique position where you can um, interact with someone socially every single time that you see them. And I just wanted to give some tips on um, things like active listening so that you can get the most out of that interaction and so that they can get the most out of their interactions with you. Um, a lot of these are intuitive. Some of them would take a little bit more work, but um, one that I find, a tool that I find really helpful is using I statements and that's reframing things so that it's coming from your perspective. Um, so if somebody's telling you that they have fallen and their phone was across the room and they didn't know how to reach out for help, you just phrase things like, I would have been really scared had I fallen and my phone been out of reach. Like, were you scared? What did you do? Has this happened before? Have you fallen before? And that kind of thing allows you to both ask those open-ended questions. It allows you to summarize what they've told you. Um, to name the emotion that they may have been feeling, to validate the fear that they may have been feeling, and then also to um, suggest patterns if you see them. So by having told you that they fell one time before, then you can recognize that this is something that's happened before and um, what behaviors may have led to that fall in the first place. And I do want you to consider um, what you find fulfilling about volunteering with MetHow at Home. I know that a lot of you work and you have family members that you take care of as well. So I know that this is a labor of love and you put a lot of energy into it. So I, I would like, just like you to reflect on what you find most fulfilling about that experience. And I would love to get into mental health. I don't think that we quite have time, unfortunately. Um, all of this information is available to you and you can reach out to me though, obviously. But the main thing that I really wanted to drive home is that our mental health impacts all aspects of our life, um, from our sleep in terms of quality and how much sleep we get, to our diet in terms of what food we're eating and how our body is absorbing nutrients, to our willingness to go out and get physical exercise or if we're getting appropriate levels of physical exercise to social social participation um, the main issue with older adults is that there's a misconception that things like depression and anxiety are a normal part of aging and they are not at all they're fully preventable and they are highly treatable but they need to be addressed in the first place and so I just give you some information on the rates of depression in older adults, um, as well as some of the signs and symptoms to look for. And that can be hard to differentiate some of these from natural signs of age, aging or changes during while aging, like changes in sleep. Um, but they really do need to be addressed because um, if they go unaddressed, the person's health outcomes worsen. They spend more time in hospitals. They're on more medications. They require more assistance, which actually drives up their levels of or risk of depression. And it also increases their suicide risk. And older adults have the highest rate of suicide of any age group in America, at the very least. And the same thing with anxiety. Anxiety has a number of causes and risk factors and reasons and signs and symptoms and manifestations. Um, but it is good to just be familiar with some of these so you have an idea of what to look out for because again, um, they're highly preventable, they're highly treatable um, and anxiety often co-occurs with depression and people that experience both disorders tend to experience much more severe symptoms of both which then 
really negatively impacts their health outcomes overall. Um, so if a community member says something um, directly to you, if you're just noticing some things about their behaviors or changes in their general environment in life, absolutely say something um, because it is just a fully addressable situation. Um, and also know that everything that you do provides social support in some capacity. The work that you do is vital to that person's physical and mental health. Um, so even if you're just providing tech help and helping someone's um, set up their phone, you are allowing them to communicate with their friends and family, um, which then provides that social support. That's really important. Helping them get to and from their uh, medical appointments, getting them groceries, just allows them to lead a fuller life on their own. So all of the work that you do is vital. And um, yeah, just so, so much appreciated. And I did get into some information about dementia um, on the survey. A, a few people asked that they wanted some more information on it. Um, it's pretty specialized in terms of working, recognizing, and then also working with someone with dementia. So it's not something that you should feel like you should just jump right into just because you read my handouts. There are a lot of resources available to you. Tipa Snow being one that is just great to take advantage of. Um, but if it's a situation where you're recognizing, you know, dementia isn't just the kind of casual, typical misplacing your keys. It is a person's um, abilities are really shifting and changing and they're losing the ability to take care of themselves and remain independent. And so their safety is then on the line. So it's something to take really seriously. Um, and if you're not comfortable in that situation, just get yourself out of it because there are people in the community that are very well equipped to work with people with dementia too. Um, and give you just some, you know, ideas of the signs of that much more extreme memory loss that people with dementia may be experiencing as the disease progresses. And then some tips on how to work with people with dementia and a have a link for a video that shows all of these in action. Um, and it's just a really great run through. And then I'd like you to throw another one of your slips away. That may be nearing the end of it. And then I did make a self-care checklist for everyone. This is something I would recommend taking some time to do. Um, either after the session, I can put the link in the chat, um, or just at some point, just to give you an idea of what your health priorities and goals are, um, the people in your life that you find important, and then just to take some time to think of something that you're grateful for today. And then I really wanted to address caregiver burnout as well. Um, this is, we're seeing a lot of this, especially since COVID, um, and it's impacting all levels of our healthcare and schools and homes um, because burnout is for everyone, unfortunately. So I just want you all to be aware of some of the differences between um, burnout and compassion fatigue and stress. And so burnout is a gradual onset. Uh, it's the physical symptoms of being chronically overstressed. So exhaustion, headaches, um, a decrease in your ability to concentrate, uh, increase in irritability and compassion fatigue is a very sudden onset and um, compassion fatigue comes from being in a situation where it's your job to care a lot about people in really challenging situations so I always think of social workers in low-income schools and they're trying to help these people that are already in a situation that's very challenging and helping them work in a system that's not always working in their benefit to begin with so um, it's just that um, you kind of care so much for so long that you are so fatigued that you can no longer care. And there's some overlap in the signs and symptoms of the two, um, but fatigue is really marked by that apathy and that no longer being able to care about the work that you're doing, about the people that you're working with. And to differentiate stress from burnout, um, 
Stress may be a precursor for burnout, so you obviously still need to address it. But stress may look like putting in way too much effort, caring way too much, um, feeling anxious about the outcome, feeling a little drained of energy. Whereas burnout, you stop putting in as much effort, you stop caring as much, you just feel unmotivated to engage rather than feeling drained from it. Um, but as I said, stress can lead to burnout. So you still need to address those stressors in your life before it gets worse. And then to distinguish um, depression from fatigue and um, stress and burnout, if you do make those efforts to address all of those stressors in your life and your situation's changed, but you feel no emotional change, then you're likely facing depression and should seek some assistance with that too. And just to give you an idea of some ways that you can support yourself, if you are experiencing some of these things for you all specifically, you may want to change up the types of service requests that you are responding to. So um, if it's becoming too much of a financial burden to do transportation, uh, given fuel costs what it is and reimbursement being what it is for that thing, maybe you volunteer to do admin work instead or become a walking buddy. Um, if you are a phone buddy with someone, but you're just really starting to dread those phone calls, then maybe you switch to admin work or you switch to transportation or you switch to tech support. Um, you have a ton of different options that still go to the greater good of the community. So just consider what you are volunteering for. Um, and I want you to think about how Met How at Home can make you feel better supported. Um, we do, I do have a, a follow-up session that I'd love for everyone to sign up for. That'll be on April 25th. And so just taking some of those ideas of how you can be better supported, what you may like changed or um, areas of opportunity that you see, just bring all of that stuff with you um, and we can pass it on and you can start that dialogue. And Elder abuse, thankfully, I have been told that it's never been an option or option, uh, a thing that's come up with um, at Matt Howe at home. Um, thankfully, it's never been an issue, but it is something that also goes underreported. And I think it's important for people to recognize um, risk factors and signs and symptoms of potential abuse so that it could be um, reported. So here's just a handful of signs of abuse. There's a lot of overlap between them. Um, they're pretty big red flags. So they, some of them may be more obvious than others. Emotional abuse, I think is a little bit harder to see and gauge than um, physical abuse or neglect. But just a few things to keep in mind when you're interacting with people, like if they typically use a walker and their walker suddenly been taken away from them or um, if their personal hygiene really changes and it's it's the type of thing where it was already kind of out of their control, that might be a good one to take note of. Um, when it comes to emotional abuse, increased fear may look like flinching or like closing up and staying really tight when somebody approaches them. Um, yeah, just something that's very important to um, be aware of and, um, report if you feel that it is necessary. So if you see something or suspect something, contact MAH immediately. They would be the ones to connect with all of the necessary, um, or all of the appropriate agencies. That wouldn't be your job to do. You already did your job by reporting it to them. Um, you may be asked to make a statement about the details that you saw and um, why you made the report in the first place, but that remains confidential unless the case goes to court. And even if it does go to court, you are protected. Um, so it's in your best interest and in the person's best interest for you to just go ahead and report things that you see and you report. Um, there are pretty serious consequences for not reporting abuse as well as for reporting false accusations. And you are entitled to follow up with MAH if you have reported something and you just want to know what happened with the person. You are entitled to do that. 
And there is a lot of information available online for um, or regarding the Washington State Mandatory Reporting Laws. And I have that information for you as well. And so then you would be throwing your last slip away. And the idea uh, behind that activity was just to really reflect on um, some of the losses that you may experience as you age and um, really get in that perspective of some of the people that you're helping that have maybe lost some of their physical abilities that would allow them to engage in those physical, those, those favorite activities. Maybe they've lost that person that meant so much to them. Um, it's just to kind of get you in that mindset and that perspective. And I made a resource, local resource list that is likely incomplete because there is so, so much in this community. Um, so if you do see that I've left something off, just let me know and I will update it. And then I wanna just say thank you to you again um, for all of the work that you do, for all the work that you continue to do. And to just say that there's absolutely no expectation that you do more than you feel you can or should. So if you feel unsure, or unsafe, always contact MAH and somebody will be there to support both you and the community member that needed the help in the first place. And then just to wrap up, um, we don't need to go over takeaways because I'm already over time, um, but I do just wanted to ask everyone to sign up for that follow-up session and that's just to provide me feedback and to hopefully get your little wheels turning so that you can think of um, areas of opportunity for the organization as a whole that can go back to the board. And I believe that is it for me. Ooh, thank yeah. you, Colleen. That's a lot of information to um, be integrated, but a lot of great stuff. Now that I heard it twice, I'm like, oh, that was great. <laughs> to 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 reinforce things so any questions for colleen before we part ways here well it's i don't know it's amazing work i have to say i'm very impressed <laughs> thank you yeah yeah well have, having gone through you know myself a period of time was breaking my wrist learning that I had osteoporosis, getting a, um, a diagnosis on my back. I, I have gone through a lot of this stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have the contacts and the uh, support. Good. Yeah. So I know better how to help because I've been there. <laughs> yeah. In some yeah. Places. Anything yeah, I have lots of different program ideas sprouting all over. <laughs> lots of good seeds here. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. I thought that was excellent. Oh, good, good. Thank you. You organized things, Colleen, for me. I had a lot of little pieces floating around, but I thought your organization was good and helped oh, good. me think about ways I could move forward in my work and also in, in my thinking. You helped me with that. So thank you. Awesome. And all this is available um, on the YouTube or how do we access? I think the recording of this will be on YouTube, right, Tracy? And then yeah. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking because yesterday I ran out of time too. Um, so I'm thinking I may do a recording just me running through all the slides and having that be available to you too. So I'm not rushing through and I can give a little more detail. Um, and then all of the documents that I've made will be available to you. I think I'm going to try to have them emailed out the end of this week so that you'll have access to all of that stuff too. Great. Well, yeah. So just look for an email from yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. And good luck, um, on the completion of your capstone, Colleen, and oh, congratulations you. on your thank PhD. You. That's, uh, tremendous amount of work so congratulations thank you yeah i'm so glad that you have chosen this population to bring your skills and your knowledge to and uh and i've learned a lot 
through this too. So <laughs> it wasn't just me bringing stuff. It was everyone else bringing it to me too. So, yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, I have found working, working with folks like who are the most vulnerable, they are definitely my biggest teachers usually. And it's a real gift to have that opportunity to get to know people and listen to their stories and try to make, bring a little bit of ease and relief and connection to folks is just so gratifying. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. Well, thank you. Thanks for hanging out with me, even though I ran over time. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everybody. See you later. 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 Later.